back to the books at the start of a new school year. Tonight, we get schooled on the state of public education in Hampton Roads. It is what matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis, and here's what matters. When it comes to school, there are things you want to cut and things you don't want to cut. You probably want to cut the dropout rate. You want to probably cut the number of schools that aren't making the grade. You probably don't want to cut teachers and core competencies for global competition. Doing all that in an economy that's squeezing school budgets is just one of the very many challenges facing superintendents across Hampton Roads as the new school year gets underway. And we are very happy to have four of them with us tonight. On the south side, Dr. Stephen Jones is the superintendent of Norfolk Public Schools. Dr. James Merrill is at Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And on the peninsula, Dr. Gary Matthews is at Williamsburg, James City County. And Dr. Eric Williams is the superintendent of York County Public Schools. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being with us. Particularly in a time frame that I guess is pretty busy for you as you, as you kind of get back to school. I'm happy to have you with us tonight, particularly because when I have a conversation about uh, some of the larger issues in education, where we're going and, and, uh, and how we will get there. Uh, we, we talk a lot about the goals of education in terms of this idea of preparing our young people for this global economy. Uh, Dr. Jones, I know you've done a lot of work around that and, mm -hmm. and have been thinking about how we go about doing that. You know, Kathy, thanks for having us here. Um, this is a topic, obviously, that's very important to all of us. I, I just want to cite one statistic that came from an author's name is Daniel Pink and I was just sharing it earlier if you take a look at India and you take the top 15 percent in that country these are people that are very fluent in English most have an advanced degree all are highly motivated individuals that that are aggressively seeking uh, to to be the best that they can be that 15 percent represents a total that's equal to the entire workforce in this country and that's what we're up against. That's what we're competing against. And Katie Haycock, who was just recently here, has looked at some statistics. And we're falling well short of the mark when we compare performance of our kids, even our top kids, with kids in other parts of the world. So as you look at that fact, what do you think is behind that? Where, where is our focus? Where are we putting our focus that ought not to be, or is there another place it, we should be? I, I have to say it a very simple way. We have still not come to grips that education in this country is an investment mm. as opposed to being an expenditure. And when we take a look at our priorities and where we're spending our money, I mean, if you just look at professional development, right. we spend less than just about every corporate entity in this country. And you cannot invest, you cannot not invest in education in terms of professional development and, and, and nurture teachers and keep good teachers and compensate them yeah. and expect to have an educated workforce. And speaking of teachers, there <laughs> is this issue that I know is staring all of you in the face that has to do with the pending retirement of essentially a, a, a generation of longtime experienced teachers. Uh, Jim Merrill, mm -hmm. you, you're facing that in the beach, I suppose. We are. The numbers are probably larger. Um, and yet, in some respects, the, the, the economy is helping right now because mm -hmm. folks are looking to switch careers. And so we are getting degreed folk who are, who are moving to education and being extremely successful and finally satisfied with their choice. Um, and I'm encouraged, too, by the, the, the much younger generation, our current high school students who are seeing education as a nice choice. They're already on a glide path toward education as they go to college. But one of the things we know, or we, we are told at least, is that competitively there are other jobs that pay more. So when these young people that are positively motivated get to college and the recruiters get to them, uh, the best and the brightest are, are sort of funneling off to more profitable uh, vocations. Sure. Well, it's back to what Steve said. Until, until our nation really reveres teachers yeah. and the profession and is willing to pay for that reverence, will always be competing from a second place mm. position, I think. Yeah. Uh, Eric Williams, what are you seeing in terms of, um, of this issue as it plays out in York County? You're, you're brand new there in York County, having followed a very long-term superintendent. Yes, although a year certainly does go by quickly. Yeah. In terms of teachers, I think it's not just attracting teachers. I think a crucial issue is the retention of teachers. And two factors I would say that 
that are important to focus on in terms of teacher retention is one just having an environment in which there's support for one another, collegial support, to getting through um, the challenges of teaching on a day-to-day -day basis and then growing professionally long term. So that's one issue. I think another uh, factor to focus on is what are our expectations for teachers and really expecting them to stick with those instructional strategies that attracted them to teaching and really trying to capture the joy of teaching as opposed to a more short-sighted just test prep mentality which actually leads to driving teachers out of the profession right. and exacerbates the problem. We do this uh, daily radio show from noon to one on 89.5 and when we talk about this we inevitably hear from a teacher who has said I get out of it because I got tired of you know, teach the focus and the stress of the standards of learning tests, particularly those who teach in grades where that's a factor, um, and, and the, the insistent pressure to have the kids do well on those tests. Do you see that pressure abating any? Uh, um, I think that it'll be interesting to see what happens with potential reauthorization of NCLB. No but child e left behind. Yes, mm -hmm. and it, but even before that occurs at the school level, we need, at the school division level, we need to make sure that we're creating an atmosphere that supports capturing mm -hmm. the joy of teaching and learning. So yes, we need results. We need our teachers to teach the curriculum. That accountability for teaching the curriculum, that's important. But let's do so in a way that draw, that really draws students mm. in into the lessons yeah. that teachers are working on with them. Well, Dr. Gary Matthews, congratulations. Five years in Williamsburg, James City County. Well done. Well, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I've enjoyed every year. I'm, I'm sure of it. Uh, I wonder how you think about these issues, because it occurs to me in a, in a community like yours that is drawing marvelous retirees from all over the country. I, I know there may be a temptation for somebody who's retired, who's raised their children to say, hey, mine are done, I don't have a lot of interest in that, and, and, and maybe not a lot of interest in paying the taxes to support it. Well, I certainly agree with what I've heard at this table tonight. Uh, public education is certainly an investment, and I think until we see it as that, as opposed to uh, an inordinate expense, we're going to continue to see us lag behind Indians. Uh, in the nation of India are the Chinese whose top 15 percent also mm -hmm. speak uh, more English in numbers than we do here in the United States all of whom have, have laptop computers as well so they're teaching in this top echelon to be sure in both India and China to go back to Daniel Pink's right. work how to analyze take information apart how to synthesize how to put it back together again and how to evaluate things how to render judgments as a learner and as a worker and I think that is helping the Indians and the Chinese be most competitive right now with workers in the United States. So until our kids in our mm -hmm. classrooms do indeed get beyond test prep right. and get to analyzing, synthesizing, evaluating information and being able to construct their own knowledge, will we be truly competitive with the rest of the world. And I don't want to sound so doom and gloom here, but you talk about no child left behind and we've talked about accreditation mm -hmm. tests and all the rest of it. A lot of people say these tests aren't necessarily uh, coming up with or leading to the kinds of skills uh, that, that we're talking about here. I'm not sure I, I, I totally agree with that because if you look at the assessments and you look at the alignment of the curriculum and, and you assess what we're teaching, particularly in, in the area of mathematics, uh -huh. I believe uh, we are preparing kids. However, it is high stakes and I think Eric's point about looking at the total child the one mistake I think that we've made is that we've allowed at the federal level and at the state level for um, regulations and rules to be imposed with few, if any, local expectations for what we want. And there are local dollars that support education. For example, in Norfolk, local dollars are, uh, take, a, take into account all of the funds we have for, for school construction. Mm. So I think our citizens are still not convinced that what they want to see their children grow up to be, they're not seeing the schools actually moving in those directions. For teachers at this juncture, it's all about the test. It's all high stakes. We're the only profession that gets an annual report card where individual school divisions and schools are compared with every other school in this region, in this state, and across the country. And that kind of accountability forces us 
to look at those measurements and say that it begins and ends with that. I know that there's been some coverage recently on some of those results in, in Norfolk Public Schools. Uh, some schools that, uh, that, that perhaps uh, are not necessarily uh, uh, going to be accredited. That's right. Um, how do you respond to that and what's well, I want to put that in, in I want to put it in a context. Uh, less, than, less than eight years ago, only two of our 49 schools were accredited. We're at 44. We were at 47 at one point, but then we went into every grade testing and we were content specific testing over this past year. I have 35 elementary schools, 22 of those schools are Title I schools. That means that two thirds of those kids are on free or reduced lunch. I only have one school that didn't receive accreditation and it missed it by three percentage points, which was up 20 points from where they were last year. I have five comprehensive high schools. They were fully accredited. I have nine middle schools and four didn't make it, two in math and two in social studies, and they both missed by about two percentage points. Mm. And the reason we missed in social studies was because we had the first uh, a testing of sixth grade U.S. history. And unlike my colleagues, we did not do a preliminary test last year, so this was the first time for us. But that sounds like I'm offering excuses. No, Kathy, it, I'm no it doesn't I'm just at all. telling you the picture yeah. that, that I'm painting for you is one that I accept the responsibility for that. But I cannot sit here and say to anyone that our people are slacking off because they are hardworking, dedicated, knowledgeable teachers and administrators. This is the thing I think that's so interesting about these tests is that you sort of have to start at a level and if you are, there's almost the curse of starting out well, if you will. You know, if you start out at a certain level, the deal is you're measuring growth and progress. Mm -hmm. and that, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I, and I guess all of those things you kind of need to take into account. And it is an all or nothing deal, is it not? I mean, it's either you're in or you're out, you're up or you're, you're down. I mean, it's a, kind of an all or nothing deal. Um. It is, uh, you know, and ultimately by I think 2014, it's 100 percent or none. Uh, but but is that is that well, um, appropriate if given everything else that kids come to school with? Uh, no. <laughs> NCLB, for intent of legislation, is sound. Mm -hmm. We want to help every child. No sure. one would dispute that. Absolutely. The practical application of it has been. Um, foolish mm -hmm. uh, in some of those aspects. And we're, we're, every division, every district probably in the nation is on a collision course with this by the time we get to the, to the deadline year. I want to go to the testing piece mm -hmm. just, just quickly though because I think we've let the game be defined for us. Uh, we, we lost our voice I think as a profession several years back. What I think we should be doing is, is, is working to change what we consider to be the right kind of measures for kids based on what we think they need for the future. Being able to pass a certain uh, percentage of multiple choice tests is nothing that our employers or our higher ed professors or anyone says is important or that they need. So what we're working hard on, I think we all are in various ways, is trying to redefine the skills and agree upon those that we need to measure our kids by in terms of success and then designing assessments to measure things like problem solving and the ability to work in groups and collaborate and, and use technology and, and, and global solutions. That's real different. Mm -hmm. That can't be reduced to a multiple choice test. That will be a very tough challenge for our profession, but we've got to go there because the kids are not getting what they need to be prepared when they leave our doors. Uh, so we're living in two worlds, uh, and I spoke to many people a week or so ago. We've got a foot on two playing fields, and we've got to play in both games. We've still got to live by the standard accountability and the standardized tests. At the same time, we've got to be redesigning what we need for our kids. And so uh, I've just been telling our folks, deal with it. It's a, it's a, it's just it's a dual world for yeah. a while, and you're still going to be assessed publicly by the old things, but the bar is much higher for what kids need yeah. in terms of the skills they need for the 21st century. Kathy, so, may, may I intervene mm -hmm. just for a moment? Mm -hmm. I want to piggyback on what Jim was saying. Uh, I'm very much uh, pro-accountability in terms of the way I view education. I think our public is going to demand accountability and we're all up to that test. But I think Virginians who look at the curriculum in the state should know that the standards of learning here, and I've worked in four other states as a school superintendent, the standards of learning in Virginia are really quite rigorous. What's minimum about them is often the cut mark for passing. Mm. such that if a child scores 56% of the items correct on some test, that might be called passing. That's minimum. 
but the standards and the contents and skills they represent in general are really quite rigorous. And some studies I've looked at shows uh, Virginia standards to be amongst the most rigorous uh, in the United States. Having said that, where I really agree with what Dr. Merrill, uh, what Jim just said was, uh, even if you accept my proposition that the standards are quite rigorous, it's often the way we assess them mm. and what we expect kids to do with that knowledge and set of skills that kind of drives us crazy with just the multiple choice yeah. uh, format. Uh, there, there, and going back to this issue of global competitiveness, there is this report that came out in 2006 and, and new reports come out from time to time on, uh, and, and essentially it was, it was the skills of the new American workforce of the 21st century. And they've made many of the points that you all have made that that we are not keeping up with our global competitors and while some may say that's why, why do we even worry about that, they say there's some very good reasons to worry about that. Uh, and they say we've got to do a lot of things differently. Uh, they talk about this issue of critical thinking and the rest of it. But they also say that you as superintendents and we as a nation are really up against some very tough issues here. Among them are the fact that we tend to do school in terms of the way it's organized the way we've always done it. High school hasn't changed much fundamentally hmm. over 50 years. Uh, you know, we still are on this agrarian count calendar. Um, and all the rest of it. So, so I wonder about that piece of it. Uh, and I, and I, I take what you're saying about critical thinking and all the rest of it. But can we move to that kind of system within a nine month school year or a, a school year in which uh, athletics play such a large role and, and, and our parents don't want anything to mess with? It, it seems like we want a lot here, I guess, as well. I'm only I'm chuckling thinking. because about three or four years ago, I was with Pat. Uh, Russo, I think. Yes, who was and, former superintendent in Hampton, now in Henry. Yeah, and I was talking to a group uh, uh, that you were, a group that mm -hmm. you had assembled, and right. uh, I cited the one simple example of starting school before Labor Day. And I can't tell you the reaction I got from the business community. No way, no how. They said, we just can't do that. The economy really needs those kids to, to work at, uh, I guess, King's Dominion and, and other places, so we just can't open before, before Labor Day. I mean, and, and you think about... You think that's a pretty simple thing. You're talking about a, a oh, yes. 10 days earlier, yes. which would give you more instructional yes. days. So, I mean, we are really caught up in a, in a very traditional approach, and, and everything is so lockstep. Time is the one variable that you should manipulate, but mm. that's the one we hold fixed. Every kid is... A, and, and the state's now requiring every kid to graduate in four years, on time in four years. And gosh, your daughter's smart, and she just graduated from one of the best schools in the country. But she may not get through UVA. That was public school, by yeah. the way. <laughs> she may not. She may not get through UVA in four years. But right. will she be? Will she be viewed unsuccessful if she if it takes her five? Right. Really interesting. The other thing I would tell you is that we, my daughter did just graduate, so we're hearing from a bunch of these kids who are now facing their first week or so of college classes, and what they invariably say is. Oh boy, this is different. You know, it, it mm -hmm. is a different sort of a world, and a lot of them are really, you know, f facing some challenges. You were talking about that, Jim yeah. Merrill, the fact that a lot of these kids go to school, they, colleges, they're still needing remedial help. I think there's a false satisfaction by many families and parents that if my child graduated at a certain level in the class with a certain GPA, all is well. I'm not sure we should be so confident of that. Uh, I think as, as the world is changing so rapidly that even, even the supposedly higher prep students can really face a tough time when they're hitting the university and they're hitting the workforce mm -hmm. or hitting the military. And that's what I was talking about earlier, sort of redefining what kids need to be prepared to right. do. And, and, and to get back to your earlier question, mm -hmm. I don't think we necessarily need to, to, to re-engineer high school as much as we need to rethink how we work with kids in a classroom, uh -huh. whether it be from K through 12. And that's a lot of what we've been working with our teachers on. Your content is not going to go away. Don't get nervous, people. We're not ignoring the content, but we are talking about how you create your lessons mm -hmm. and how you work with kids and you are a facilitator more than a than a, than a purveyor of information. Which um, is so. different. And so what do yeah. you do about parental expectations around yeah. some of this? I think, though, parents will, res parents will respond. I don't think that there's necessarily a sense among those par parents of students who are academically success successful. I don't think among them that they feel that there's a crisis for their kids. However, when you, s when you explain what the possibilities are, I think that they, are, they do embrace those possibilities. And specifically what I'm talking about um, refers to something that Gary said earlier in terms of rigor. 
use the word rigor. And I think we need to say, take mm. a look at what do we mean by rigor. Traditionally, a traditional notion of rigor relates to uh, the quantity of content um, that is that is raced through and if you race through more content in terms of exposing students to the content that that's more rigorous but I, I would suggest it shouldn't rigor be more about um, the analysis and synthesis and application really of that content things, yeah. and yeah. it and it is still we are teaching the curriculum we're teaching the standards of learning but it's doing so in a way that that requires students to dive into it and they when they have more ownership when they when they are really wrestling with it one they're going to learn more in the short term have mm -hmm. a deeper broader meeting but um, deeper, broader mastery of that material, but two, they're going to retain that information for a lot longer. Mm. But I think when you lay that out there to parents, that parents are res uh, are responsive because they can see it when their kids have more ownership over mm. the work they're doing because their students are motivated to invest more in that work, not ju just because they want to earn, an, earn straight A's and goes to go to UVA like mm -hmm. your daughter is this fall, but because they care about that yeah. content and skills. You know, it occurs to me that I think people who are parents care very much about it while their kids are going through. How do you go about communicating the idea that we all have to care about it, whether we have children or not, whether our children are in the school or they've graduated, that it's really important in terms of how we live together that we care about these issues. And we only have like uh, 30 seconds left. <laughs> and uh, go to world <laughs> hunger after that one. That's right. <laughs> but the, the cost of not uh, educating every child uh, is really um, quite bothersome right. to e economists who look sure. at this. Whether it's cost for additional prison or additional cost in health care or additional cost for uh, a whole variety of things in our society. Children who go to that society uneducated cost the entire society more, not mm -hmm. just in terms of their own personal right. tragedy, but for each of us as taxpayers and citizens of the country. Our, it really takes a toll. Our guest speaker concluded uh, at a convocation that we face for the first time in our history having the next generation not yes. be able to reach the standards and the levels of success of the current generation. That has never happened in this country before. Indeed so. Well, I want to thank all of you for being with us. We'll come back to that statement that you just said in just a moment with my final thought. Every time we do a program on education, I pull out my 2006 copy of a report, the one to which we referred earlier, called the New Commission on the Skills of the American Workforce. Essentially, it argues that public high school hasn't changed much in 50 years or so, and what else can you say that about? Uh, the report argues for a fundamental sea change, making 10th grade the pivotal year where vocational students could graduate and enroll in trade schools or community colleges, where high-performing high college-bound students could begin to take college-level courses and essentially enter college as juniors and seniors. I don't know about all that, but I do know this much, I believe. This report also argues for boosting teacher pay to $90,000 or so for teachers who work a regular year and 110 for teachers who work year-round. The same folks who brought you that report nearly three years ago, two of them, Secretary of labor from both parties are now warning about just what Dr. Jones said, that today's younger generation is the first to be less educated than the preceding one. They argue that no child left behind is about minimum standards, but to get where we need to go, we need to raise the bar at the top. They say we need to set teacher licensing standards high enough to recruit from the top third of college graduates. Instead of penalizing poorly performing schools, they say, we should be financially rewarding the outperformers, letting educators in those schools decide how to spend the extra money. They say she, we should replace those multiple choice computer tests with high quality course based exams that will give us a better sense of whether our students are creative, innovative, critical thinkers. We need to provide short term high quality help to schools that need it and not be afraid to close schools that don't make the grade. And they argue powerfully for what budget cuts have stalled in the Commonwealth, and that is high quality early childhood education for all children. If you get behind in the beginning, it's so hard to catch up, and it isn't long before humiliation leads underperforming students out the door. It's why the authors write, we lead the industrialized world in the proportion of students who drop out. 
we just can't continue to complain about education or to assume that because my child got his, I don't have to worry about yours. This is a national competitiveness crisis. We are pouring a lot of money into a system that produces great results for some and disastrous results for others. But to make change, you have to break a few bills. And so we have to press our state legislators not to forget to raise the top while they're raising the bottom. We have to be willing to look critically at some of the givens, like a school calendar built around bringing in the harvest and athletic pursuits that seem to carry a sense of the sacred. And most of all, we need a teacher recruitment and pay scale that treats teachers like the professionals we need them to be. Over the next five to ten years, we'll see a retirement exodus of experienced teachers, most of them women. But the young women who came behind them had many more profitable options outside the classroom. Shame on us for not valuing teaching enough to make it one of the most attractive possibilities for the best and the brightest. Well, what's your take on public education? Let us know anytime online through our website. That's whatmatters.tv. You can drop us an email at whatmatters at whro.org. Join us on Facebook. We do not have enough ways for you to be in touch with us. It's astounding. We'll be glad to send you an e-bit each week if you log on to our website, and that'll give you a look at what we are working on, which kind of keeps us working ahead, too. Don't forget to download our video. Some of us don't do our homework till the last minute. What can I say? Don't forget to download our video and audio podcasts at iTunes.com. And, of course, you can always send your letters to us. What Matters, WHRO, 5200 Hampton Boulevard in Norfolk. Call us at 889-9425. Coming up, it's a multi-billion dollar moneymaker built on virtual reality. We'll take a look at the modeling and simulation industry in Hampton Roads. And in the weeks ahead, we hear from Attorney Generals, uh, from Attorney General to Lieutenant Governor to the Governor's race. We'll go one-on-one -on -one with each of the candidates for a statewide office. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week for another look at What Matters.